You don't remember the characters' names. Which is embarrassing. I need to read Taylor Jenkins. Read Taylor Jenkins. Be ready for it. And this is actually supposed to be a review of Rosemary's Baby, so no. Hi everyone, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse. Today's video is going to be my June reading rewind, which is basically my June wrap up for anyone who's new here. And if you are new here, welcome. Um, and basically we're just gonna talk about all the books that I read this month. So I wound up doing a bunch of audiobooks. Um, I went to California for just over a week and wound up not reading hardly anything that I planned. Um, I have three books as of the end of June that are in progress, which is so not the way that I operate. Um, things just got weird this month. And like, this is 100% why I never make a TBR because my attention goes all over the place, sort of life goes all over the place. I had been on this ridiculous um, reading list. I'm sure I'm not the only one who does this where you, you know, put yourself on the reading list at the library for like an audiobook or a physical book. And like, sure enough, like two days into vacation, um, the Stephen King book on writing, which is a book of his that I've read before. And it's a writing book for writers, <laughs> basically. The audiobook was like, hey, it's yours. And you only had it for seven days. And I didn't get to finish it. So like, that's super annoying. And now it's like another 14 weeks to get the audiobook again. So I only got halfway through that. It just, it was kind of a hot mess express when it came to reading what I thought I was going to read and getting stuff done. But the upside is I read some good books. I had a fabulous vacation. I am obsessed now with California. We were in like Sausalito and San Francisco, Sonoma, kind of like that entire area. I am rethinking my entire decision in life to be on the East Coast. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, but you're not here for that. You're here for book reviews. So let's dive into it. The first book I read this month was part of my project reread, and it was Animal Husbandry by Laura Zygman. And this is the movie cover, if you can't tell. So this book came out in 1998, and I don't know how many years later they made a book. They made a movie called Someone Like You with Ashley Judd, obviously. Um, Hugh Jackman was in it. Greg Kinnear, Ellen Barkin, Marissa Tomei, and. The book and the movie have a ton of differences in them. So if you've seen the movie, you can read the book and have a completely different experience and vice versa, obviously. But the book um, is less Hollywood and I enjoyed the movie for what it was. It definitely was like light kind of rom-com Hollywood ending kind of a movie. But ultimately I enjoyed the book more, I would say, because I feel like there's a better ending to it there's more Jane to it and Jane's the main character. Um, so anyway, I very much enjoyed kind of the going back in time element of this in the sense that it's 1998 and like there's no cell phones and kind of like any kind of like internet search is not as easy as it is today and sort of just being back in kind of like a whole different world and life I loved. And this is a book about Jane um, who starts dating this man, Ray, and they are sort of like, they work together, they fall in love, they have a plan to move in together, and she kind of, like, she gives up her apartment, ends her lease, it's like a couple days before they're gonna move in together, and he basically, like, pulls the rug out from underneath her and panics and is like, ugh, I can't do it. And she's like, what the hell just happened? So this is a story as much of sort of the relationship that builds between Ray and Jane and then the aftermath of it, of her trying to figure out kind of like, not just why men leave women, but why men leave her. And she winds up having to move in with another guy that they work with who has a room in his apartment. And he's, Hugh Jackman plays the character in the movie to sort of give you a sense of what the guy is supposed to look like. And he's sort of like this modern day Marlboro man womanizer he smokes he drinks and like what's also like great about this it's 1998 like everybody's smoking like at work <laughs> everyone's smoking in their offices it's like totally transported to a different like alternate universe 
And by living with him, she starts to sort of like dissect men as a species. And she, you know, was looking for love with Ray, but is not someone who like ultimately is only going to be happy if she's with a man. So doesn't sort of need the man to be happy, but it's sort of a very interesting journey with her. Um, there's definitely some, like some dated language in this, but as a whole, I enjoyed it. Um, I don't know, like I definitely have like affectionate love for it. I don't know if I would feel the same way if I was reading this for the first time, which I also talked about some of the other rereads I did. And I think that's just a function of sort of where I am in my life now versus where I was when I read this and, you know, the benefits of age and experience. But I did enjoy it. I'm glad I reread it. Um, so yes, happy to have started the month with an old favorite. The next book I listened to is Rosemary's Baby by Ira Levin. And I actually did an entire separate video on this um, all kind of alongside Lock Every Door, which is Riley Sager's new thriller, because not only did Riley Sager dedicate the book to Ira Levin, but it has been likened to it, um, I think, for sort of the, goth the gothic, sort of atmospheric, mysterious apartment building where sinister things are afoot, for lack of a better way of describing it. And I had never read Rosemary's Baby. I had never seen the movie. I knew like some loose elements of it, but I was kind of curious what the connection might be and sort of what the comparison was and kind of, you know, like what the hype's all about. I just had a curiosity about it and Hoopla had it, so I got it. And um, if you haven't watched my video about the two, um, you can do that. I'll link it for you. But um, long story short, loved Lock Every Door, didn't love Rosemary's Baby. And I know this book is from 50 years ago and I totally get that it was probably... Um, very revolutionary for its time and very shocking for its time. And I had a lot of issues with um, Rosemary herself and the female characters and things that happened in it. And I'm sure you were supposed to have issue with it, but I just had a hard time with the book. It wasn't overly thrilling to me. Like I know it's an iconic book. Um, it just wasn't a book for me, which is fine, but I'm glad I, I listened to it. I'm glad it's like, in my red list. I'm glad I understand kind of where the connections are and I can see where the connections are. Um, there were, you know, some parts of it that I did like, but as a whole, it just wasn't for me, but I will not hesitate to kind of pick up another IR-11. I definitely want to do Stepford Wives, so that is still on sort of my long-term list, but as a whole, Rosemary's Baby just was not um, my cup of tea, if you will. Next up was another reread, and it was The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. And I had intended to read this um, in August because the sequel to this, The Testaments, comes out in September, which I am beyond excited for. Like, literally can't wait. But April from Getting Hooga With It did um, kind of a Handmaid's Tale read-along in June, so I decided to pick it up in June because I wanted to participate. And I've talked about this a hundred times. I read this book for the first time in college. It was my first Margaret Atwood. I sound like a broken record. It made me fall in love with her. I fell in love with this story. I think the Hulu series is amazing. I think Elizabeth Moss does an incredible job. I cannot wait to see what Margaret Atwood does next. And I honestly, I might have even loved this book a little bit more this time around. And like, there's nothing quite like sort of the first time you read a book by an author who ultimately becomes one of your favorite authors. And I know this is not a book that's for everyone, but I find it as moving as it was back in the day. Um, this came out in 1985, which is not when I read it, in case anyone's wondering, but still, <laughs> I read it after that. Um, but it is scary how timely it still is. Her writing continues to be amazing. I definitely picked up more this time around. I think I have a much different appreciation for it. And I think there were things that resonated kind of like similar to like rereading Animal Husbandry, which like different parts of that book resonated with me this time versus the last time. Um, it was the same here. And I think there were some of the same parts still hit very close to home. I think there's other parts that I appreciated more. I think anytime you reread or rewatch or, you know, sort of re-listen to a piece of music, whatever it is, um, the more you get from it and the more you see Obviously the Hulu movie or kind of mini series has amplified that as well. And the first season of the Hulu series is very true to the book. And you have like a much um, sort of greater appreciation for how much they honored the book by having read this again now. But 
I loved it. I think it is an incredibly important piece of writing um, on all fronts. I think Margaret Atwood is just an incredible storyteller. Like I said, I can't wait to see what happens next. I'm glad I reread it. Um, it did. It made me cry. It gave me all the feels. It just broke my heart and made me angry and made me sick and made me enraged and, you know, made me want to fight and made me want to scream and made me really hopeful and made me want to cheer for Offred and all that she was trying to do. Um, it's just, it's incredible. I can't say enough great things about this book. So if you haven't read it, I would just highly recommend picking it up. I think you can still read the series or watch the series and then read the book. I think it's completely fine. Um, but like gear up folks, cause the Testaments is coming. The next book I read is Evidence of the Affair by Taylor Jenkins Reid. And this is the novella that she put out between Evelyn Hugo and Daisy Jones. And I got it, um, from Amazon Prime for free as a Prime member, which was super exciting. And I'm so glad I read it. It's like a quick read, kind of like a one sitting type of thing. It's like just over a hundred pages. And I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I loved it for two reasons. So first up, I'm not gonna say too much about the story because for one, it's short, so I don't wanna give anything away, but kind of the gist of it is, it is about um, a woman who discovers letters that her husband has from the woman he's having an affair with. And she decides, to contact the husband of the woman her husband's having an affair with to say like, heads up in case you didn't know, I just found this out and I just wanted to clue you into it. And this takes place in the 70s. So they, sort of the husband and wife who are being cheated on wind up having um, a letter communication, sort of a relationship through letters. And the entire novella is written in letter format. So you read back and forth their letters. So it feels very much like you're intimately in their lives, like you're going through somebody's stuff and reading these personal letters. And it's just, it is typical Taylor Jenkins read in the sense that it is beautiful. I loved these characters. She made me cry. I absolutely loved it. And I talked about this in my Goodreads review. There's a Daisy Jones Easter egg, which I love, which I understand if people read it before Daisy Jones, they wouldn't have picked up on it necessarily because why would you? What I love about the evidence of the affair is like you having read her earlier books and knowing that Daisy Jones is told in interview format, you really start to see the evolution of Taylor Jenkins Reid's writing and the evolution of her trying new things and trying new styles, whether it is flashback or like Evelyn Hugo being done sort of starting in that interview style and the flashback and the history and this being done in letters and Daisy Jones being done in transcript format. So I love watching her evolve as a writer on top of the fact that she's just an incredible storyteller. Um, so loved it. If you haven't read it, just read it, read it, read it, read it. Um, it's a quickie. Go for it. You won't be sorry. Next up is another audiobook, and that is The Kiss Quotient by Helen Huang. And this is probably going to be unpopular opinion, but I did not love this book the way everybody else loved this book. And everyone's been raving about, or like talking about the bride test, which is like not so much a sequel, but one of like the super minor characters who's referenced in um, the kiss quotient is the protagonist of the bride test. And people were just talking about it. So I saw it on Hoopla and I got it and sort of went in thinking it was gonna sort of be like this, like rom com -y type of thing. Um, so first up, I will say like, I'm not a romance reader kind of period. Like I like a contemporary, I like some like romance in my book. Like I read um, Love in Other Words by Christina Lauren, which is sort of the first sort of like contemporary romance I had read in a while and I loved it. And I kind of thought the kiss quotient was gonna be like that. So, um, I was in like, like, I'm not a prude by any stretch of the word, but like I was not prepared for how like steamy, graphic, sexy this book was. And like listening to it on audiobook in my kitchen while I was like making dinner one night, I was like, what the hell am I listening to? So like, I was not at all prepared for that. Like there was some like graphic stuff happening in this book. Um, so just wasn't prepared, but that aside, this is kind of like pretty woman with a twist in the sense that like our main character, Stella Lane is, um, she's like this like economics, like whiz, I don't wanna say whiz kid cause she's a grown woman, like just whiz. And she has like an incredible career and like great money and great success and everything in her life going for her there. And she is, 
sort of struggling in the romance department that she's had like a handful of failed romances that really haven't gone very far and she is on the autism spectrum um she talks about having asperger's which helen huang is also on the autism spectrum so it's a great own voices great rep and stella finds that to be sort of what's getting in the way for her so to speak and she sort of attacks this problem like she attacks any problem and she wants to educate herself and be trained and learn how to be in a successful romantic relationship because she wants more in her life than just her job and her family you know she wants she wants to have a partner and she wants to you know be taught how to do it so she decides to like go to the best of the best and she hires herself a male escort to teach her how to be in a relationship and enter michael who is sort of this beautiful um man who is just like model-esque he is i want to say he's swedish and vietnamese i think that's what he is hold on yes he's swedish and vietnamese and he you know is He's, he's a gigolo for money because he needs money for his own reasons. And this is a story about their relationship. And basically what happens, you know, again, pretty woman style kind of with a twist is rather than sort of, um, you know, paying him for one night, she realizes she needs more than just one night. And she kind of like pays him to be with her for like a month or six weeks or whatever it is. So she can learn how to be in a relationship and they move in together and here we go. So there were elements of it that I did enjoy. And I think, you know, a lot of it was like about Stella. Like she knew what she wanted. She was going after it. She had a methodical approach to things. She was, again, an extremely successful woman. And there were parts of her that um, frustrated me. It's sort of that rom com like miscommunication between Michael and Stella at times. But as a whole, I really liked her. Again, I think there was great rep on all fronts. Enjoyed it. But, and I don't know if this is the audiobook's fault or if this is just, this is not my kind of a book. But like, I found a lot of like the sex scenes with Michael talking to be cringeworthy. And it, it could be, not that the narrator was bad, but I feel like the narrator was like trying to be sexy and it just wasn't sexy to me. So maybe it would have been if I read it, but I definitely was like cringing at times. There was a lot of like, like just sort of like his, his voice, the way he said things. And like, if you've read the book, like when he talks about the sweet potato, like I literally wanted to come out of my skin. I was completely creeped out. Like I found him to be exceptionally creepy in a lot of those scenes and I didn't like it. So I don't know if I would have felt differently if I read the book or not, but like ultimately it just wasn't, um, it wasn't my book and I just couldn't, I know you have to suspend disbelief and like, I liked Pretty Woman. Obviously I saw it when I was like really young and I don't think I fully grasped the prostitute factor of it all. And I just was there for like <laughs> the romance, but like, I just couldn't get out of my head. Like that Michael talks about how he slept with like hundreds of women. And of course, like, they fall in love and they have a chemistry like never before and you know they can't talk about it and like she's not supposed to be in love with him because she's paying him and he's not supposed to be in love with her because it's his client and you know there's all this stuff that goes on in the background so i mean it was definitely like a light easy kind of a thing it was not a book that i had on audio when anybody else was around because there was no way i needed anyone else to overhear this book um and i think i just wasn't totally prepared for what I was going into. So I definitely was like, what? Like, they're, what? This is happening. But um, I have no interest in reading The Bride Test. Um, so like curiosity has been cured, I guess, about the Kiss Quotient, but I definitely am not someone who loved it the way it seems like everyone else who I've listened talk about this book loved it. So there you go. Just, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about a book that I totally did love, and that is The Silent Patient by Alex Michalides. And this book was so incredible. Like, I've heard people talk about it. I completely understand why. So damn good. Um, I read this in three sittings. I couldn't get to the end fast enough. It was, it was twisty. There were great characters. It moved at a great clip. I think the pacing was great. I think the story was great. 
I thought I knew what was happening. He would like flip the switch on me. He had me going. He would like, ugh, like kick me down another street. Like it was just so good. Like I was just all over the place in all the best ways. He totally got me. Um, I'm such a huge fan. I'm so impressed. This is his debut. He has, um, he's written at least one, if not two movies. So he does have a screenwriting background, but this was just such an incredible book. Um, sort of just a snippet of what it's about. This is about this artist named Alicia, who, this is like page one, she shoots her husband in the face like five times and no explanation, no anything, and hasn't spoken since. It's like five years later, she hasn't talked. She went on trial, all of it, hasn't spoken a single word. So she is in this psychiatric institution along with a whole bunch of other people who have done really horrible things, um, who have been deemed sort of, you know, um, insane basically. And the psychotherapist Theo has decided like he's followed the case. Everyone has, it was obviously front page news cause she murdered her husband was like a famous photographer that she murdered. And Theo is convinced that like, he's the one who is going to break through and get her to talk and hear her story and understand why. And kind of the tagline is like, you know, you can get to the truth, but when it's time to hear the truth, do you even want to know it type of a thing? So like, is Theo going to kind of regret trying to find out what the truth of her story actually is? And uh, it's just so good. I can't, I can't even say anything else. Just so good. So good. Couldn't recommend this book more. I was like I said, completely into it. I'm a huge fan of his now. Um, I totally get why people talk about it. It is, it is messed up for sure. Like, don't get me wrong. It is messed up. There's some, bloody scenes. I mean, she, you know, shoots her husband in the face five times. So obviously there's some gore to it. Um, it's a whole bunch of stuff going on. I'm not even going to say anything else other than that. I completely freaking loved it. Um, if you're wondering, yes, this is the UK cover. I bought this when I picked up Daisy Jones and the six from book depository because I liked this way better than I liked the U S cover. And I think it was like a couple bucks cheaper, but either way, here it is. Um, silent patient, you have to read this book, you guys. If you are looking for a thriller or looking for a good ride and a fast read, this is the one. The last audiobook I listened to is Forever Interrupted by Taylor Jenkins Reid. And this was her debut novel. And it is about a newly married woman, Elsie, and her husband, Ben. And they've been married for two weeks. And he hops on his bike to run to the supermarket to pick something up. And he winds up getting hit by a truck and dying. So that's kind of like the opening page. It's a lot. And at the hospital that night, Elsie winds up meeting his mom, Susan, who not only has she never met before, but Susan didn't know that Ben and Elsie got married and kind of didn't even know that Elsie existed. So you can imagine what kind of tension um, transpires between these two women. And this story is told in dual timelines, so we go back in time and see Ben and Elsie's relationship, which in all fairness was like a five month whirlwind kind of extravaganza. Um, but we totally understand their entire relationship. And then in present day, we see Susan and Elsie trying to figure out how to have a relationship, um, doing everything from having to plan Ben's funeral to, you know, coping with not just his death, but also why Ben kept Elsie a secret and all of these pieces. So Susan is not like, I don't know if she's recently widowed, but she's widowed and Ben was very protective of her and Elsie has a really fractured relationship with her parents. Um, so it's a lot sort of very Taylor Jenkins Reid esque in the sense that it is just a great character study and complicated characters and people who are struggling with, you know, on the most obvious level with this book about life and death and grief but also about, you know, sort of how to push on and how to move on and how to move forward and how to be vulnerable with people and how to let people in and sort of how to, you know, cope with things that are out of your control and how to face things that are out of your control and how to forge new relationships and how to strengthen relationships you already have and dealing, like I say, with grief and with loss and, you know, sort of, you know, seeing things in a new light and Susan thinking she had one relationship with her son and realizing maybe there was something different there and them getting to know each other, um, you know, being connected through Ben as his wife and as his mother and how they knew him. And it's just, it's, 
it's a lot and it's a lot in a good way it's it's a it's a very well done book and you know what I've learned is that I definitely I need to read Taylor Jenkins Reid's books and not listen to them because I think I had talked about this when I had talked about One True Loves last month, which I also listened to on audio, which I also enjoyed. But I personally have a completely different experience when I'm listening to a book versus when I'm reading it. And I'm very conscious of the fact that there is a disconnect and a bit of a distance for me between the story um, when I'm listening to it versus when I'm reading it and how I experience it. And I don't want to be disconnected to her stories. And I think I really need to save the audiobooks for for nonfiction for sure. Um, maybe for thrillers, which I've done a couple. Um, you know, I think maybe sometimes if I can listen to some and then read along with it, if I happen to own the book and also listen to the book, I like to do that sometimes. But I feel like I am missing out by not physically reading these books. And it's just in how I process the books. Um, I also am so obsessed with her writing that I kind of consciously, constantly want to be underlining and dog-earing pages, which you can't do when you're listening to an audiobook on Hoopla. Um, an ebook would be completely different, but the audio definitely... I did cry at the end of this book. Like, she definitely... Like, there were moments throughout the book where I, like... I think if I had been reading it, I would have had a more visceral, emotional reaction to it. Um, so I very much enjoyed it. I would say... That's now the fourth Taylor Jenkins Reid book that I have read, having just discovered her in April, as you know if you follow my channel. Um, I would say it's my least favorite of the four, but by no means a bad book. And again, I'm not one to like give star ratings here, but I would, I wanna say I gave it like a 3.5 stars on my Goodreads because I liked it. Um, I didn't love it. I do think I'm at a slight disadvantage having started with Evelyn Hugo in the sense that it just, it blew me to pieces that I think anything is going to be hard to meet or top that book. But at the same time, had I not read that one first, I don't know if I would be so obsessed with her. So take that for what it is, but all in, very much enjoyed the book. So I quasi participated in Buzzwordathon this month. I was having a hard time focusing, but I wound up reading two books. Um, the first one being I Found You by Lisa Jewell. And I wound up listening to the audiobook of this. And I really enjoyed it. So I guess I would say so it's like a little bit domestic suspense slash more domestic than suspense. And it follows sort of three different storylines. And we have one, uh, or actually two in the present day, I should say. So it kind of, the gist of it is, there's a man sitting on the beach and he sort of like has nothing with him, no identification, nothing. He's kind of in the rain. And this woman who has a house on the beach, she's out walking her dog and she sees him and she's kind of like, hey, are you okay? And, and sort of against her better judgment, but she can't quite help herself. She invites him in to see if he's okay and to help him. And he doesn't know who he is or how he got there or anything about himself. And sort of at the same time, many cities away, we have a new, um, newly wed a wife who I think she's been married like two weeks or something like that. And her husband didn't return home from work. And she is new to the country. She's from the Ukraine. She, they, this whole story takes place in England. And she doesn't really know anybody. They had this whirlwind sort of relationship. She's never met his family. She doesn't really know anyone or any of his friends or anything and she goes to the police and comes to find out you know from the police that her husband is not who he said she was who he said he was and in fact the man she married doesn't exist so she's like what so we're on her journey of trying to find out who her husband is and where he is and then we go back in time i want to say maybe like 20 years and it's um a brother and sister who are like high school age, I think they're like 16 and 18, are on a summer holiday with their parents um, and they meet a guy who lives with his aunt. I think he's like 19 or something like that. He's like, just like a couple years older than the, the daughter. And the daughter and this guy kind of wind up having like a little bit of a romance, but the brother is a little bit gun shy of him. And it's like, is he just the overprotective brother or is there something kind of off about this guy? And we see sort of that storyline play out and somehow everything does eventually connect in the end. But I really enjoyed this book. I think Lisa, Lisa Jewell is a great storyteller. I really, 
her books are much more about characters than thriller or suspense. So there is an air of like mystery of like, who's the guy on the beach? Who is that woman's husband and where did he go? And kind of like what's going to sort of reveal with this family while they're on summer holiday. But it's not like, you know, here's a dead body and it's a police procedural or, you know, someone's gone missing and we're amateur detectiving trying to figure out what it is. So it's really a very interesting story about the relationships and it is about family relationships and like parent and child relationships, brother, sister, husband and wife, um, friends, friendships, and sort of, I'm like so all over the place trying to describe this and doing a really bad job of it. But she just weaves such beautiful stories together and I think she has great characters who are, who are complicated and who are, you know, sometimes unlikable and sometimes you're not sure who to trust and you're not sure if people are making the right choices and people who are, you know, doing things out of the goodness of their heart and people who think they're doing the right things and people who are just sort of living their lives and sort of trying to survive in some ways and trying to find human connection and trying to find answers to questions. And I really just enjoy her so much. So I would highly recommend this book. I think the audio was really well done. I'm sure it's just as good in physical format. Um, if you're curious about Lisa Jewell, I wouldn't hesitate to pick this one up because it's another one that I think she just did a brilliant job at. Um, and I really, really loved it. And the last book I read, which I started during Buzzwordathon, but in all honesty, I finished it when I got back from vacation at the end of the month because I wasn't going to carry a hardcover across the country with me. And it was Us Against You by Frederick Bachman, which is the sequel to Bear Town. And I cried my eyes out for so much of this book. And so much of it was because Frederick Bachman is such an incredibly gifted and beautiful writer that it wasn't even moments of like really bad things happening and I cried. Like it wasn't even about that. Like there were literally just lines. Like there would be one line that was so moving to me for whatever reason, whether it was something happy or something heartbreaking or just the language of it all that literally brought me to tears. Like I have not cried this much over a single book in a long time. Like buckets, like really cried buckets. And I had mentioned this in um, my mid-year freakout tag. I was afraid to pick this book up because I had such huge affection for Beartown um, when I read it back in January. And I was afraid that reading the sequel was gonna sort of diminish it or maybe take something away from it or kind of ruin it. You know, like when uh, sometimes like a movie sequel will or like when the TV show jumps the shark where it like changes everything. I just had such huge love and affection for Beartown and for all the people, or almost all the people in it. Um, but it left off in a way that it could have just been a standalone book. And I didn't think it was possible to sort of love this story and these people even more than I did the first time around. And I do, I really, really do. This was just absolutely so well done. Such an interesting continuation. Um, you have to read Beartown to understand this book, but for anyone who like read Bear Town and was like, oh, like there was so much hockey in it, like I couldn't stand it or that didn't work for me. There's next to no hockey in this. So there's like a game that we see, but it's it's not, it's much more about the characters and where they're at. And I wanna say this is like three months after Bear Town ends. So um, summer has come and gone. It's kind of like the end of summer going back to school. And we see where the kids are at and the parents and the town and everyone. And, there's new characters that are introduced and all of our old favorites and friends and everyone are there. Um, I'm so in love with Benji. I really am. I just think he is just one of the most beautiful characters I've ever read. And I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I was like cheering at the end and now I want more. And I don't know. I remember hearing like that it might be a trilogy. Um, it's a completely satisfying ending, but again, I'm just so happy to be back in the world of all of these people, and I want to know more about where they all end up. So I don't know. I don't know if there's gonna be more to it, but if anyone's hesitating to pick up the sequel for all the reasons I was, or for any other reason, don't hesitate, because this book was incredible. So that was my month of June. All in, it was nine books, which is like not bad by any stretch of the imagination, but I definitely, sort of typical me. And again, this is why I don't make TBRs. I didn't read half of what I planned to read starting in the second half of the month, but I also wound up reading some really good books. So 
no shame in my game. This is where my month landed me. Let me know what you guys read this month. I hope you guys have a great rest of the day or night or whatever it is at the time that you are watching this. And I will see you in the next one probably a few days from now. So thank you guys for watching and I will see you soon. Bye everybody.